Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, I'm off to Frankfurt in a few hours for a business trip, which should be my last business flight for the year. Just some local-ish drives to see member companies and some prospective members. Maybe a couple of congressional visits, but I take the train for that. But since I am heading to Germany, I thought we could use a conversation this week with graphic design guru Stephen Heller on his new book, The Swastika and Symbols of Hate, Extremist Iconography Today, from Allworth Press. Uh, two of my previous business trips to Germany come up during our conversation, but this is not a, well, not necessarily about German use of the swastika. Um, a lot of Stephen's book is about uh, contemporary white supremacist uses of such symbols. Stephen's book is a pretty daunting project. He, this is the third edition of it. He explores the history of the swastika, its iconic use by the, the Nazis, and the question of, of whether the symbol, which was originally a, a Sanskrit symbol for good luck and has echoes in iconography throughout the world, which he documents, is redeemable or not. And if it's not, which is where he sides, what makes it irredeemable compared to other symbols? And um, it's a it's a challenging book. It also examines... Well, both the innocuous and the, the malicious uses of the swastika throughout history and how it's evolved, well, how it did evolve into to punk rock kitsch and how we lose the historical context for symbols like this one, especially this one. He also goes on to provide a, a guide of the symbols of a lot of contemporary white supremacist groups and those symbols relationship to the swastika, as well as the the history of racist movements in the U.S. It's it's done as a series of essays, although that section is more like a, a handbook slash guide, um, which I know does not make this sound like the most appealing of books to jump into. And Stephen tackles a lot of difficult questions in the swastika and symbols of hate. And even if you don't agree with him on every single point, you know, the, the book really helps foster debate about free speech how to fight back against the the resurgence of, of nationalism and, and supremacist movements, the power of symbols, again, what is redeemable and what isn't, and, and a lot more. Stephen's a powerful writer on this topic, and his passion for it really comes out both in the book and in our conversation, where he freely admits that his, we'll say, obsession with this has, has um, been a key driver in a lot of his life. Um. The Swastika and Symbols of Hate from Allworth Press, it's a necessary reading in this era. And I don't mean that, you know, it's a guilt read. Like I said, Stephen's a fine prose writer. The book design and layout are just flawless. I found it impossible to put this down. Um, I read it essentially in one sitting over the, the, the course of an evening. Um, it is, it's really important. It's really designed well for, you know, reading and, and understanding what's going on, what the stakes are, what the history is of this symbol, um, and what we, what we make of our times going forward. And as we talk about during the conversation, the hope that maybe there won't need to be a fourth edition of this one. Now, we got together a few weeks ago at Stephen's home to talk about it and also to pick up some loose threads from our previous conversation about 18 months ago. Um, We'll get right to it. Here's a short version of Stephen's bio from the book. 
Stephen Heller, former art director of the New York Times Book Review, is the co-chair of the School of Visual Arts MFA Design Slash Designer as Author uh, Author and Entrepreneur Program. He is the author, co-author, and editor of more than 180 books on design, social satire, and visual culture, including Iron Fists, Branding the 20th Century Totalitarian State. He writes the, well, he used to write the Daily Heller for Print Magazine, it's on hiatus now, and contributes to Design Observer, I, Wired, The New York Times, and The Atlantic. He is the recipient of two honorary doctorates, the AIGA Medal for Lifetime Achievement, and the Smithsonian National Design Award for Design Mind. He lives in New York City, and his new book is The Swastika and Symbols of Hate, Extremist Iconography Today from Allworth Press. And now, the 2019 Virtual Memories Conversation with Stephen Heller. So you're, you're reissuing the swastika and symbols of hate. It, it, had, previous, it had previous incarnations in 2000 and 2008. Is it depressing to, to the need to bring it back now. well it's a reissue but it's a revision yeah and it's depressing that the times are such and the president is such that it is necessary to revisit the subject the swastika part of the book is pretty much the same as it was in the original book, which was called A Symbol Beyond Redemption, question mark. Um, the newer portions have to do with hate symbols and the g- growth of uh, white nationalism, white nativism, survivalism, mm-hmm. uh, and all those other uh, violent isms that are being encouraged by the commander in chief. And that question mark has turned into an exclamation point? Well, it's interesting. There's a a book that I've read recently on the swastika as a Buddhist symbol versus the Nazi cross by a Buddhist priest. Mm -hmm. And he and I are going to be speaking in public at SVA in about a month. And... His belief is that the German cross, the the Hackenkreuz or hooked cross, is not the swastika. That the swastika has a totally different meaning. Mm -hmm. And I point out that the swastika was hijacked. And when he and I discuss it, the semantic difference is that he doesn't feel the swastika was hijacked. It is not the swastika. Yeah, I, which I, is yeah. a semantic problem, because whether it is or it isn't, it's what it is. The the, the connotation for right so the much form the world. is similar. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, wherever it was mistranslated, because Hitler actually never uses the term swastika in Mein Kampf, he uses the word Hackenkreuz once. Mm-hmm. Um, wherever the other uh, translation of it came from and whenever it happened. I've traced it back certainly to the 20s, but it goes further than that in the English language Mm -hmm. uh, to 1896. Um, The form is what we recognize, and the form is what implies evil. And his argument with me is, why would you consistently call my spiritual image evil? And that's where it becomes uh, an interesting debate, but doesn't solve anything. No, and, and you mentioned something along those lines near the end of the book, where you're accused of cultural appropriation or colonialism where you say, yes, the person accusing me is correct. However, I'm not wrong. Right. And that's I much tough to reconcile, but... But yeah. what I 
try to do, not in the book, but in my head, is try to substitute the swastika for other significant symbols, mm -hmm. whether it's the Star of David or the Crescent yeah. uh, and Star or the Crucifix itself, which began as uh, an execution device. Uh, how would I feel emotionally and intellectually if somebody started using that in a negative context. Well, the Star of David was, was used say, in yeah. a negative context by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. So was the letter J. Yeah. And you could argue that the Palestinians see it in the same light. So there are all these ambiguities. And at a certain point, you just have to put your foot down and say, this is the way I see it. Even if it's not a uh, bright being, line. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not a straight line. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sympathetic with the uh, other point of view. I wouldn't even call it the other side because there's no side to take. Yeah. But answering your question, I was both depressed that I found a reason for revisiting the book and happy that I had a chance to redo the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What changed from past editions in addition to the newer material about the, uh, about hate groups and symbology? Well, the f first design, um, was very loose. Uh, and after a while I felt that it didn't have as a design, it didn't have the gravitas that I wanted it to have. Mm. It's also a thinner book, so it was more like a fest shrift mm. than uh, a serious book. And originally, Mirko Illich was the designer of this, in fact, the designer of the first one. And in this one, he uh, brought it more into line with what I felt the book should look like. And he also suggested the paper over boards cover, which gives it a certain heft and authority. He also designed the cover of both. The first cover had the swastika cut in half, and the bottom portion was at the top, and the top portion was at the bottom, with the conceptual idea that you can cut this symbol in any way, shape, or form, and it still is the symbol. Right. And he went a step, evolutionary step further. And in this book, which is the swastika and hate symbols or and symbol, symbols of hate and yeah. symbols of hate, uh, he just puts in the white circle in which the swastika was positioned and the red cover. And you still know what it is. Mm -hmm. There's no getting around what is being discussed, even if there was no title whatsoever. Right. You'd still have that, that immediate yeah, connection. Yeah, I met Mirko uh, when I, I was recording with Milton Glazer, and we're talking about doing one at some point when he's, he's back in the States. But other symbols that are off limits? I mean, in the book, you go on that continuum, and the hammer and sickle is clearly the, you, you know, the closest correspondent to yeah, it. Yeah, I, I talk about the hammer and sickle as not having the same toxicity. Yeah. Despite the body counts being... Despite yeah. Stalin's reign of terror. Um, but that is... You know, what I will admit is that this is not an objective journalistic or uh, deep scholarly dive. This is more uh, a essay in book form where um, I'm not taking into consideration all of the intricacies and all of the arguments. So I raised the question, why is the swastika, the Nazi swastika, uh, not as reviled as the hammer and sickle? But that doesn't... Or vice versa. Or is it more reviled than the... Yeah. 
why is it more reviled than yeah. the, the hammer and sickle? But I'm not taking into account those who suffered f yeah. under the hammer and sickle. Uh, a lot of what the hammer and sickle meant was the antithesis of our American propaganda. Uh, you know, there was hope in the beginning of their revolution, uh, bringing together the worker and the farmer uh, in a classless society. You know, if you bought into that at that time of yeah. history, uh, the hammer and sickle was a perfect icon of that. It ultimately became a symbol of the Soviet Union, which became our enemy. But for a long time, at least the length of World War II, after they gave up their alliance with the Nazis, you know, the hammer and sickle was our friend. Yeah. So I think the my logic may be inconsistent, but I don't think the hammer and sickle became... Uh, as terrible in our memory as the swastika continues to be. Mm -hmm. And the hammer and sickle, quite frankly, became kitsch. Yeah. Uh, I used to buy Soviet flags at Johnny Jupiter, <laughs> yeah. you know, or little buttons with Trotsky's face in them. And uh, so... That inconsistency is a flaw. Right. Oh, when I was in Budapest in the early 2000s for a friend's wedding, um, they were selling the Three Terrors T-shirts with Hitler, Stalin, and Mao with, you know, tour dates on the back, you know, 56 and, and 68 and all this. And it was, um, I actually bought a Joseph Stalin bottle opener from the, um, uh, the Terror Museum for the, the secret police's old place. So yeah, things, things turn into <coughs> merchandising at some point or another. Yeah. And it, it happens with Mussolini as well. There's mm -hmm. in his hometown, there's a whole museum and there's all sorts of fascist souvenirs, yeah. including little bottles of wine with his picture on it. And of course, Mao in China, there's tons of, uh, souvenir material, lighters, clocks, T-shirts, books, empty books, mm -hmm. um, you name it. And it and it also for heroes of the left, like Che Guevara, yeah, who's... Uh, who has become a fashion accessory. And in the book, I quote Woody Allen as saying, you know, in a hundred or two hundred years for, the swastika will be a fashion accessory. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that in Sleeper. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of irony always happens. The punks used the swastika simply to shock people. It weren't that they were Nazis. Mm -hmm. They were surf Nazis in the 50s who may have uh, been what we would think of as white supremacists today, but back then it was just, they were rebels. Yeah. Now my, my first trip to Germany, uh, God, maybe about eight or nine years ago, I was in Frankfurt. Actually, I was in Ravensburg. I flew into Frankfurt visiting a, a client out in Ravensburg. Kid, uh, I'm being driven by a PR person. Kid comes walking out of a pharmacy with a T-shirt that says Gegen Nazis on it with a fist coming down, smashing a swastika. Now, it's my first day in Germany, and I've got some family history, so I have some serious trepidation in general about being out there. And I had no idea what I was looking at. The PR person's driving along. I'm I'm googling away madly on my phone. Gagan means uh, against, against, which I didn't realize at the time. Lucky, um, again, I had the other phone with me. Apparently, youth tolerance and inclusion gang, um, who you know, the fist is smashing a swastika. It's not pro Nazi. The problem was. Um, they, according to Wikipedia, uh, Germany was playing a friendly match in France uh, a couple of years before this. And when Germany scored a goal, these kids unfurled their giant flag of a fist coming down on a swastika in France. 
and proceeded to get beaten to a pulp by the the security guys and and hauled into to jail and eventually their lawyer had to come and explain against Nazis not pro but still we understand this is not something you would fly in France it may have been bad taste so they got sent back to Germany and and that was it but but yeah it was between that and my second trip to Germany where I was taking a train out to Nuremberg to see that for a couple of days and passed a farmhouse flying a confederate flag and had no idea what that was about had to look that up and discovered when swastikas are banned in your country you right. apparently fly a confederate flag as your your code of of there was a documentary that showed this little village um that were was inhabited by uh german nationalists neo-nazis and it was f the swastika is illegal uh some of the german iconography nazi iconography is illegal so yeah the the stars and bars were there as well yeah i mean it's what's interesting about all of this is that it's all connected to a cross um, the swastika is a cross with mm -hmm. hooked ends. Um, the Confederate flag is a cross. Uh, the Celtic cross, which is used by white nationalist groups, is a cross. Mm -hmm. The uh, symbol that is used by the KKK is a cross. The symbol they burn is a cross. Uh, so the cross, in a sense, has even more significance overall and has more ambiguity to it than anything. Mm -hmm. the, this book on, on the, the Buddhist symbol, the swastika, which is an Indian Sanskrit term for good luck or good fortune, um, his book says that Hitler was basing a lot of his rhetoric on Christian ritual. And, and when you listen to his speeches, if you can bear it, uh, he talks with amens and looks up to the heavens mm -hmm. and speaks about Almighty God and does what a preacher, a priest whatever would do in uh, a tent ra a tent rally or or, or a revival a, yeah or bible thumping kind of thing uh and so he wanted to replace his cross for the christian cross hmm. yeah, when you first started the research which again had to be more than well 20 years ago um since the initial edition came out in 2000 what was your biggest surprise, I guess, in terms of, of trying to get to the, the depths historically? Well, the biggest came surprise came before the research. I yeah. mean, I've got cabinets here filled. I gave most of my uh, fascist material to the Wolfsonian in Miami mm -hmm. uh, for my book, Iron Fists, Branding the 20th Century Totalitarian State. But the swastika attracted me as a young kid um, that it was this symbol of not the Holocaust, but of our enemies during the great war that we won. Mm -hmm. And my mother's cousin, who I guess is my second cousin or first cousin once removed or something. however they, they he yeah, was yeah. in Europe and he brought back a swastika battle flag and he his son another cousin and I would kind of wave it around the house on holidays when we all got together on Central Park West yeah. and you could see the horror in people's eyes but <laughs> um, yeah. my biggest surprise was how prodigious was its non-Nazi use, not the spiritual usage, because that came later, but the commercial usage. Um, that it was 
just incidentally used on everything from hair products to detergent to crackers uh, to greeting cards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a few years ago in a Chinese market back in New Jersey, it was on a, a dried shrimp package. And I figured, you know, at least it's not kosher anyway, so, you know, it makes sense to have this this swastika on it. But, yeah, it's still our connotation and not necessarily. Right. Well, it's everywhere in the world, yeah. you know, including in some synagogues. Mm-hmm. I would periodically get a, a spate of calls from different journalists around the world asking me to comment on uh, a swastika that they found in a, in a church or a synagogue or on a public square. Uh, and what they, sh- you know, there was a, an uproar about what to do about it. Should it be removed? Should it be uh, destroyed? Should it be preserved? And I would always say that, you know, it's, it, there's a context and it's a good learning moment to learn that the swastika was not just the Nazis. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a good learning moment to know what, how powerful symbols are and how powerful graphic design is, logo makers are, symbol makers are, when they put something uh, in the world. Yeah, and I think that's the... The aspect of it that that fascinates me about your role with this book, just that sense of for everything else that's terrible about it, that it's an amazing piece of graphic design, that it's so arresting and and capturing, which, again, gets you, got you at a a young age, uh, just the the symbol, the color, everything is is just... Everything is arresting, and when you see color photographs, or black and white photographs, because there's no color in this book, purposely... That was another thing that Mirko and I both agreed on, that it should be a black and white book. Uh, When you see them in multiples, when you see them on banners, when you see them held by those little wavy flags that everybody, every nation has, when you see all of that en masse and critical mass... uh, it's incredibly powerful, but it's also incredibly powerful for what we know about it. Yeah. And another reason for doing this book was, and I don't know whether I'll be successful in my goal or not, but was to kind of reacquaint younger designers with the symbol and by extension, younger people with the symbol that the Holocaust generation is dying out and will it still be seen as the representative of that horrible period of time? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there are other symbols that are coming into our field of vision now, like the ISIS logo, the, the black ISIS flag with the white Arabic yeah, lettering. Um, there are other things that are going to be meaningful to us, but a good example is look at the Japanese flag. It's one of the most beautiful flags ever made. Uh, a red circle on a white or off-white background. For a good four years, it represented a day that will live in infamy. Mm -hmm. And their battle flag, the rising sun, is just such a remarkable graphic image. But anybody looking at it today will just say what I just said. Isn't it beautiful in its simplicity? You know, do you encounter that with younger students? Is there a sense? I've just, I'm divorced from like young people, so I have no idea how much or little a grasp of that sort of history they have. Well, I give a lecture to my design history students Mm -hmm. uh, on the swastika and and logos in general. And their interest is less in its historical ramifications than with 
how do you make something this. that is so simple? Yeah, the academic or technical aspects. Okay. Yeah. So there are there. Yeah, that, that's sort of what I'm wondering, whether the, the connotation of, of evil is carried with it. Well, Stefan Sagmeister, uh, an Austrian-born American designer, sh showed me from his Instagram feed where he invites people to send them their best work and he will comment on it. Mm -hmm. He showed me this. I had given him a copy of the book and he showed me this image of a what looks like a W, but what it also looks like is a swastika deconstructed. And his response to the designer was, you can't do this. It looks too much like a swastika. Yeah. And indeed it does. And indeed what many of the right-wing, ultra-right-wing groups have done is deconstruct the swastika. So... In one of the vo volumes of the book, the earlier volumes, I show a German swastika where all that's left is the hooks. They took out the, the middle bars. part. Yeah. And you still know what it is. Right. Um, so that there's an afterburn with the symbol that uh, still has resonance and... Young students don't know what that resonance is. And yet they're exposed to the near the end of the book is almost a guide. Well, it is a guide of various neo-Nazi um, organizations and their symbols. Right. Yeah. I took that mostly from the Anti-Defamation League and Southern Poverty Law Center websites mm -hmm. where they've been following... Um, hate groups and they'll show their symbols and I did a an edit of them there are many of them I did an edit of the ones that were more connected to the swastika than others and also added those that I knew uh, that were not on the uh, particular websites mm. but you know the neo-Nazi movement, well, the Nazi movement itself existed in the United States prior to our entry into World War II. It was very popular in New York City, in Manhattan itself, um, in the Yorkville section on 86th Street, there were bars and stores of German Americans that all had swastikas in the windows and there were marches almost daily of gray shirted and brown shirted members of the German American Bund and there were dozens of organizations that had these sympathies and there were also very rich people who were supporting these ideas particularly anti-semitism uh, so, you know, the symbol has had a life in the United States that wasn't interrupted until the war and then kind of came back after the war because we didn't put any legal restrictions on the symbol. Would you have been a favor or something like that? Or are you free speech absolutist enough to... I'm not a free speech absolutist. Okay. Uh... There's been a lot of talk about free speech absolutism and a lot of writing that I've been reading. And, you know, I don't believe in yelling fire in a crowded theater. Uh, I also don't believe in hate speech. And what your interpretation of hate speech is, hmm. you know, can be debated. Um but for me, the I guess the test was the March on Skokie, uh, where the American Nazi Party that had been uh, formed by G George Lincoln Rockwell, who incidentally was an illustrator who showed at the Society of Illustrators, um, 
th that group applied for a permit to march in a dominant, predominantly Jewish neighborhood. And, and one filled with survivors. And one filled with survivors. And the argument against their marching, against getting a permit, was that the speech in itself would be hurtful and harmful to the residents. Uh, the ACLU took that case on, and they won. Uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, free speech is not about the implication of negativity, but the action of negativity. So if the, if the march caused a riot, then they would be arrested. But the actual idea of marching through the neighborhood with these vile symbols was not, was within the bounds of the Constitution. I think that's bullshit. Yeah. And they ended up not marching, but... They ended up winning and not marching. Yeah. yeah. We well, have the same thing with the Klan applying for a um, patent or a, a trademark for their yeah, symbol. For their and symbol. Getting, well, uh, essentially... Well, they lost. It, it was, they uh, gave it up. Yeah, it, I guess same thing. They abandoned the, the claim, but it wasn't rejected. Right. So, you know, I often think... I use a lot of symbols in this book without permission. Mm. And we're, come at me. <laughs> we're in an IP age yeah. where uh, you can file a suit for just about anything. Mm -hmm. And because publishers are so sensitive to IP and there's so much that publishers want from an author that in a logically illogical world, my publisher could have said, you need permission slips on all of this. Yeah. Go, go contact the, uh, the white Aryan resistance and make sure it's okay to use their, right. their, yeah. Which who knows? Let me ask, you mentioned the, the again, profusion of, of images in the book. Sam Gross had a, I think it was 101 uses for a swastika. Right. Mel Brooks, a chunk of his career, um, Lampoon Nazis, but, you know, also threw him up there as an object of ridicule. Even uh, Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, which right. I went to the opening matinee of just so I could get a six-hour jump on seeing Nazis get killed. Which was based on a true story, incidentally. That there was a Jewish... Uh, there was a Jewish resistance that scalped <laughs> Nazis. <laughs> which, again, I'm totally down with, which will be another question further on. But that idea of humor... Well, around it's interesting, and also again, I'm personal not, preference. You're not applying this to the entire world. No, I'm I'm inconsistent. Yeah. I wrote a negative review for the Jewish magazine, The Moment. Mm -hmm. I think it was for them against Sam Gross's book. Yeah, uh, I felt that it was uh, trivializing the image. Whereas I love Mel Brooks. Yeah. And I have on my wall in my office a poster called Doing the Hitler Rap, where Mel Brooks is dressed up as Hitler with his arms out. And there was, in fact, a video mm -hmm. of Mel Brooks singing uh, yeah. a rap song about Hitler. Um, I read the book Guess Who's Back, which is about Hitler coming back I moderated a panel about that at the Goethe Institute with the author and a couple of well, and a Holocaust scholar and a translator. Right. So you saw the movie and the book. I only read the book. Okay. The movie. But that raised the question of, along the lines of Mel Brooks, is it okay for a Jewish person to make those jokes? And when is it okay for a Gentile to make those jokes? Because the author of Look Who's Back is not Jewish. Right. Which I didn't realize until partway through the conversation, and that sort of changed the tone. Hey, it's one thing for us to make these this sort of thing. I'm not sure how comfortable I am with somebody who's not Jewish. And I know, same thing, it becomes this... Yeah, well, emotions slope. kick in. Yeah. And, you know, I read the book with a certain amount of pleasure. It was... Yeah. Uh, you know, I've always loved those what-if 
kinds of books. McKinley Cantor used to write them uh, in the in the fifties. You know, what if the South won the war and that kind of thing. And there was a sister publication to that. Look who's back. I don't know what the actual title was, but it was about Mussolini yeah. coming back. So I was waiting for Stalin, and then the movie The Death of Stalin comes out. <laughs> so, Which uh, is another one that I find funny but uncomfortable. And, and... Funny but uncomfortable, but what I did realize, and the director... Energy, yeah. Uh, he said whenever they showed images of the NKVD arresting or killing people, they didn't do comedy. No. They only did the comedy when it came to the yeah, Politburo. Politburo guys. I will say also a friend of mine whose parents are Russian emigres uh, says that the whole scenes with Beria, like picking the girl from the, the crowd, right? That that was what they went through in the 50s. Or yeah. the, the 40s and 50s. They saw the, the parade come through and they were all in dread that Beria was going to pick somebody's young daughter right. to take for a couple of days. So, yeah. Anyway, the question of, of humor and, again, the Mel Brooks, the Sam Mel, Gross, and everything else yeah, in between. Yeah, the, the Sam Gross, I guess, just hit me at the wrong time. I mean, yeah. I think Sam Gross is hilarious. And mm -hmm. his funniest move, uh, movie, his funniest cartoon was of the frog it's still who had the lost his legs. <laughs> you know, I also used to love Kleban. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess when that book came out, it was just too close after my doing the second edition of the Swastika book, which I did adding an afterword, uh, which was a way of balancing out this desire among many people to re redeem the symbol and how there is still hate swimming through the air. Uh, so I felt awkward, but springtime for Hitler, I thought was hilarious. And, you know, I see that image of the audience in shock and then breaking out in laughter. And, you know, today, yesterday, uh, and all the days before, comedians just rip apart Donald Trump. And as frightening as Donald Trump is and as infuriating and as hateful as he is, you need that comedy to mm -hmm. give you some sense of perspective and hope. Do you, though, run that risk of... Uh as we've been putting it, normalization for the last thousand plus days um, of this administration, but that risk of normalizing Nazis and, and, and hate with lampooning them and making them seem. Well, that's where I'm not sure. To, to I mean, that's yeah. why I, I did the book on the swastika. There are no yeah. jokes in the book. Mm -hmm. There are some clever lines, I think. I mean, I love, writing titles with puns in them usually they get taken out by editors oh but, that, that was always my gig with the trade magazine too <laughs> but um yeah there was a rule at the new york times that the pun also had to really mean the the, the original the, yeah the on the face meaning yeah yeah so um you know uh, there's a time for humor and there's a time not yeah. for humor but it's doubly difficult when it involves Jews because we make jokes out of everything. Yeah, well, you know, Jews make make humor out of their their misery. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll tell you, although it wasn't done by a Jew, uh, "Life is Beautiful" was to me not funny at all. Yeah, and I I went to see it with Art Spiegelman. And Francoise Mouly and my wife, Louise Feely. And we were there with Paul Theroux. No, it wasn't Paul Theroux. It was Paul Auster. And he got up first. We were in a screening room. And we all just ran out. And he wanted to discuss it. Uh, we ended up realizing that it was a terrible movie, which, of course, won the Oscar. Yeah. 
but uh, you know there are lines you have to draw and I, I don't know how far those lines extend. I didn't like Inglorious Bastards either, mm-hmm. uh, even though I've read books. I forget the author's first name, but Cohen, who wrote a book about the that group of, of Jewish soldiers who went out and took revenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, was very happy to hear that that took place even though there's also ambiguity there that they might have pulled out an innocent yeah well that sort of thing's always going to go too far basically when your your practice is scalping the evil i discovered you know the 43 group and the the 62 group no oh uh british jewish veterans um who formed an anti-fascist group back in the initially in the post-war era, then they reconstituted in the '60s. Vidal Sassoon was part of the, I think, the original group. Hmm. Uh, I only discovered this because a friend of a friend of the family, old old man, was sort of just prattling on to me at a bar mitzvah once uh, a while back, and eventually I realized he was talking about beating the hell out of out of for the '62 group, uh, anti-Pakistani. Uh, activists and and beating them into a pulp and leaving them in trash cans for for the police to find, and then I said to my mother, "I'm, I'm sorry, what is Morris talking about?" She goes, oh, he was part of a vigilante group that used to beat up fascists, and there was another one in the '40s that really went after Osley and and his set, um, which is always great when you see Jews actually muscling up and and you know doing something. But again, everything has a risk of well, everything has a risk. Going also, too far. I mean, I used to publish a publication that was distributed by the old murder incorporated and yeah those were jews and uh you know n- knowing that somebody is jewish doesn't make you part of you're not excused their clan yeah you know there are all different shades of behavior mm-hmm. and i've had you know as much conflict with Lonsman, as I have had with others. Yeah. But along those lines, is it okay to punch out a Nazi? I know that's one of those, those counter memes we have for all of the, the neo-Nazi memes on the other side. But You know, it's not okay to do violence mm-hmm. to anyone. If they're, the Antifa is a kind of SDS-like group, And I was never fond of SDS. Yeah, you don't speak of them highly when you refer to them in here. So, you know, I think the Antifa was a good alternative in Charlottesville. Uh, But that's to say they were used like Hitler used the stormtroopers. They were just thugs. Yeah. And going back to the nineteen early 1930s and late 1920s, the communists had uh, their own group of thugs of paramilitary. So I, I, I think violence just, you know, cliche begets violence. And uh, on the other hand, it's okay to see some elderly Nazi who had been a concentration camp guard uh, be tried for war crimes. Mm-hmm. And my mom, back when she was working for El Al back in the early 60s, knew the guy who actually put the pinch on Eichmann, which is another great story of uh, uh, Jewish um, activism. We'll we'll put it in those lights. It is. But, you know, there has been a movie about Eichmann where he there's a certain amount of sympathy you feel. Uh, I mean, that's the problem with trying to humanize even the devil um we're we're our inclination is to feel empathy for people i think yeah you know somebody like trump doesn't seem to have empathy whatsoever but i think if you're a normal person or what the neo-nazis call the normies uh you have empathy and therefore on an individual basis uh, those you have prejudice or bias for 
you can argue we're human beings and deserve human treatment. And I've seen a few depictions of the Eichmann story, and there are times when you feel, you know, he, he had a family, he had this, he had that, but ultimately he was a mass murderer, a bureaucratic mass murderer. Earlier this year, I, I recorded with uh, Deborah Feingold, a uh, photographer lives a few blocks from here, and she's working on a project where she's photographing illustrators and graphic design people with the idea that they're doing, well, they're in a position to do more for resistance in this era than other types of artists. We'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, do you see a sort of responsibility along those lines and a sense of impact from graphic design and from illustration? Well, in this, I uh, think anything that will show uh, resistance to this administration is useful, but whether it would succeed or not is another story. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need f the politicians and the leaders to come out and say something. Uh, and then they're supported by artists like Steve Brodner or Adele Rodriguez or Barry Blitt or Anita Kunz. Uh, these are all people who can take ideas that are... Uh, that rebel against the current administration and make witticisms, visual witticisms out of it. And the visuals last longer. But um, do we have a responsibility? Some people do and some people don't. Some people can't. Yeah. You know, it takes talent to make good satire. Mm -hmm. And do you feel a certain impact? Or do, you, do you see an impact outside of the silos that we all occupy i don't or venture that, too far from the silo yeah that's what I, I wonder you know if it's it's a great new yorker cover but the only people who are going to see it are new yorker readers right and yeah it's been about 18 months since you and i got together and i was checking in las vegas the over under for the number of books you've published since then was uh, a dozen even should i take the over on that how many books have you put out in the last year and a half or so. I honestly don't know. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go with over on this one. Cause I think, you know, you're in that prolific phase of editing and, and producing. But There's probably one ninety something. You're all there. total. Jeez. But you stopped on the, the daily heller. For a few well, months. I stopped. I had no choice, but to stop, uh, you're the daily. magazine was, went into bankruptcy mm -hmm. and, uh, so there was no more ability to do it. There actually is, at the moment, a Daily Heller site that I'm not using yet. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a plan to start a new publication that I'm doing with Debbie Millman yeah. and a few other people. Uh, so I keep putting up little notices that the Daily Heller is on hi hiatus, uh, and I do put up on Facebook old pieces, or I'll use Facebook to make a, a minor statement about something. Like today, I got up and I started thinking of Harold, uh, not Harold Macmillan, Macmillan, the other Macmillan who was the Prime Minister of England and did the piece in our time. Yeah. And I was looking at a, a what Trump was saying about how Syria, the Kurds Turkey. are uh, really happy that we did this. And um, so I made two posts. This is what tre treachery looks like. Um, you know, I would have done a longer piece on that if I was still doing the Daily Heller. But uh, I write once a week or so for Design Observer. And... I actually, I mean, I have projects that I have to finish, so I actually like having this time where I'm not 
I was wondering thinking about the daily hell if you were able to, to transition out of that without well it, withdrawal. it's been hard there's been withdrawal but you know it's like anything you do you kind of get into the groove then when you stop you wonder how you can get back into the groove yeah so I, this summer I went five weeks uh, I had so many episodes backed up I went five weeks in between doing interviews and I lost my mind it was just the you I didn't feel relief no, I, I felt like I was falling into a spiral. I'm like, I really need to just sit down at a table with somebody with a couple of microphones because it is not good when I have that much of a gap between. Yeah, them. no, I feel yeah. that way, and then I feel. But on the it's other hand, it's nice just to yeah. lie in bed, right? Um, if I didn't have anything to do, I'd go crazy. Yeah, but. Uh, but you got a few more. I've got more stuff in the works. Now, uh, something that came up very recently, I was recording, well, first with Bill Griffith, who mentioned that you were the first person to, to buy one of his comics. Um, and then Stephen Guarnaccia, who I think had a similar, maybe, maybe for illustration, had a similar story. And I remembered our Bob Eckstein uh, reference the last time you and I talked and uh, Stephen proposed the idea of a documentary about all the people you gave their first gig to. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's come up or whether there's a, uh, you know, a, 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 an old get together of everybody you basically brought into or gave their, their first. Uh, there isn't. Assignment and, for. Uh, but I have a know, feeling I, they'd be very happy to, uh, you know, contribute to something. Stephen Brodner has a, an exhibition up at the School of Visual Arts Chelsea Gallery. Mm -hmm. And he made some nice comments. I wrote the introduction for his catalog. Um, but, you know, I, I just happened to be in a, a good place at yeah. the right time. And I don't... I, I'm writing a memoir. Yeah. At least I'm trying to. I got some p dummy pages done and submitted it to a publisher who seemed to be interested but other than that, and the memoir really goes into more intimate things that start in my early teens. Uh, other than that, I don't see the need for documenting me. Mm -hmm. I would like to do a documentary on others. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately for me, my son is a documentarian, so he's kind of fulfilling my little fantasies. So I'll pitch him the idea. We can interview all the other people. You can just be the silent guy in the background who, you know. Yeah, no, it's not the, something that is on the top of my bucket list. I'm with you. Again, I, I you've, you've never seemed self-aggrandizing in, in that respect. It's just the looking back and seeing guys like that saying, oh, yeah, yeah, Stephen gave me my first gig. You know, I know, right place, right time, et cetera. But well, I have an ego like everybody else, yeah. and you know, I'll I'll sit in an audience, and when somebody's talking about their work, I'll say, I wonder if he's going to mention me. Yeah. So it's not like it. I'm free of that kind of self interest, but it's just not something I would. Uh, Put up on a big screen. Well, it's not something I would go after. Mm -hmm. There's Scott Dadich, who has been one of the executive producers for Abstract on Netflix. Yeah. And he did a great film now in their second series, but he did a great film on Paula Scher. And recently uh, he produced a great film on Jonathan Heffler, the type design. Oh, yeah. What? That's the only one I've seen from the second series. Yeah, so that's far. the only one I've seen from the second series. And it's wonderful. And, you know, there was a purpose to that film. And the purpose was there's a lesson to be learned here. People don't know, use type all the time and don't know where it comes from. So and this film was very instructive and had great special effects and Jonathan is extremely articulate. And so that was wonderful. Uh I don't think I have the the stuff for that kind of mm -hmm. film. I mean as it is 
when I lecture these days, I feel, you know, sometimes the students know more than I do. Yeah. I recorded with Milton Glaser a couple of, a few months ago. And um, one of the interesting things that came out of it for me, I I watched him and one of his, his, the guys in his studio working on a uh, poster or design. And he was directing the other person on what to do, move this over here, make that bigger, you know, make the logo bigger. Ha ha. Um, but when we talked, he said, you know, a, he doesn't use a computer, let somebody else do it all for him. Mm -hmm. But also that the computer is good at making you do the things computers are good at. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes you need to not be working on a screen that, you know, you're, you're essentially kind of getting funneled into the effects that it's primed for. Right. Is there a sense of, of limitation in that, in your experience, or is it something you try and steer students? Well, I think Milton gave a talk uh, to my students uh, at MFA Design uh, as our first kind of guest lecture mm-hmm. talk. He's He's taught in our program uh, the program I run with Lita Tolerico, uh, for many years. And, you know, he wants more time to do other things. But he gave this wonderful talk, and part of it included that line about the computer. And it really was interpreted and embraced as every designer needs how to draw. Yeah. And, you know, things don't start on a computer. Things get done and finished on a computer. Uh, But that said, there are many different ways of starting a piece of work. And so what he can accomplish without getting into that funnel is much greater than what some other people can. And I recently put together a a show for a lecture that I have to give in November, and I started simply by pulling images and putting them into a keynote. And I juggled around the images until I got a visual idea of what I wanted to do, and then I started writing it, and I'm still writing it. Uh, but that's similar to, or equivalent, I think, to starting with a computer and then finding what your content is. Yeah. Yeah, I had wondered, partly because shortly after being with him, I uh, recorded with Vitold Vibchinsky, this architecture writer mm-hmm. who has a book out the pencil. where... Hmm? He wrote Oh, the yeah, pencil. wrote the pencil. He also did one about the chair. Right. Um, and the mall, which from New Jersey, I find, you know, compelling. Um, they had this uh, piece where he's talking about a, a architecture student who was recruited to, to help with this, um, putting up a couple of houses down in Charleston, South Carolina, and how the kid managed to get through University of Penn's architecture school without ever actually doing architecture drawings. And that this is the way things are taught now. Mm -hmm. And that once he was actually in this situation, it's, oh, I got to learn to actually do this and and draw this, even though, again, we paid all this money for architecture school, but I've never actually drawn a set of plans before. Um, So, yeah, I wonder in that respect, it it was all tied into how digital keeps you from some of those skills that, that, again, as Milton would say, you need to, you need to draw first. You need to to have that basic thing in place. Well, you know, you can't run until you learn how to walk kind of thing you'd think uh so last question would your mom be proud that you're the swastika cop like when the 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 press calls asking about you know what should be done with with these swastikas as a good jewish mother would would it be one of those points well, of she pride? wasn't a good jewish mother oh okay but, never mind <laughs> i mean she was she was proud of me she was proud of the things i did she didn't quite understand most yeah. of them uh, the bigger question would be is, would my grandmother be proud? Yeah. Because she was the one who's my, on my mother's side, whose f- family, or at least half of her family stayed behind mm-hmm. 
and were murdered somewhere between Loj or Woj and Auschwitz. Um, and she was the one who never spoke about the Holocaust. And yeah. the only reason I learned about the Holocaust and her family was because I found a postcard from someplace in Poland with all the Nazi stamps on it yeah. saying, you know, we're okay and don't worry about us. And it came in 1946 or 47. Uh, so it had been in some mail pouch that the yeah. occupiers found and s started sending these things around. Hmm. Uh, and was the letter date, the postcard dated? I don't remember. Itself? Okay. I wasn't that interested in it because I really didn't know all I, yeah. by that up until that point, I just liked watching more movies. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't an ideological or philosophical yeah. thing. It was just entertainment. Uh, but I had this record of Hitler's speeches. And when I was in my early 20s, maybe even 19, I bought a telephone answering machine. It was one of the early ones. Yeah. And I put the Hitler speech on the machine. Yeah. And she got very upset. So on, yeah. I think she would be very unhappy that I've continued this little obsession of mine. Mm -hmm. Hopes that you won't have to do a, a revised edition in another 10 years? Many hopes. I don't think I could handle it. I don't think... I think there are other scholars out there that could probably do a much bigger, deeper dive... Um, I've done two books and God knows how many articles on this material already. There are an awful lot of people who think, make jokes about it that, you know, when they're with me within, they try to guess how many minutes it will take before I talk <laughs> about this stuff. Yeah. And there are others who quite seriously think, you talk about it too much, that there are other things in the world that are as or more important, and that uh, your obsession is kind of like preventing you from thinking about or talking about or acting on what's going on in the real world now. Do you take those seriously? I take it seriously. I, you know, anybody... Can you, can you correct for those? I'm sorry? Do you feel that you correct for that or well i feel like i take it to heart mm. uh, but invariably i'll be with people and i'll start Perfect. talking about it so you know it's it's like any idiot savant uh, or someone who went to harvard because they'll mention going to harvard within the first 90 seconds of I these meeting them. yeah uh or just talking about, you know, I, I have an obsession with BBC mystery mur and murder shows. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about that a lot. Uh, but. But the swastika the, grabs everybody's the attention. The swastika is, I just hope that it would be nice not to end on a negative note. Mm -hmm. That I wrote about a memorial to a friend, an illustrator who died recently. And I just wanted to end on a positive note. Whereas my heart was telling me to end on a kind of sorrowful note. Mm -hmm. So with the swastika and symbols of hate, I'd just like to end on the note that, uh, this is all a blip. Mm -hmm. Gegen Nazis. Gegen Nazis. His big fist smashing it to pieces. Yeah. Stephen. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me. And that was Stephen Heller. His new book is The Swastika and Symbols of Hate, Extremist Iconography Today from Allworth Press. As I said at the top, it's necessary reading, but it's also highly compelling in a beautifully designed book. So do yourself a favor and check it out. 
Stephen's website is hellerbooks.com, but that hasn't been updated in a while, so you're better off following him on Twitter at The Daily Heller, all one word, and Heller is H E L L E R. The Daily Heller is the same name as the blog he ran daily up until July when Print Magazine went kaput. You can find the archives for that at printmag.com slash daily dash Heller. It's in the bio of his Twitter feed, so you can just click on it there. He's also on Instagram as The Daily Heller. And after we wrapped, I asked Stephen, so, who you been reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I'll get the third quarter 2019 episode up soon. I am headed out to Frankfurt in a couple of hours, so it's not going to happen this weekend, and I'm not taking a laptop with me on the trip, so we'll have to wait till I come back. Until then, the second quarter episode features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Sotoropoulos, Caitlin Foisey, Seth, Nina Bunjavak, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessim. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, which I kind of sort of had a breakthrough on uh, on November 1st, which I don't want to tell anybody about, but a good friend of mine who I've been texting back and forth with about it, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at Stephen's home, and I violated one of my standard, standard operating procedures to do it. I parked down on East 23rd Street and walked over instead of just parking up on 96th and taking the two and the three. And that's why I paid $65 for parking plus $12 at the GW. I am kicking myself for this. Even getting across town afterwards was a nightmare when I was trying to drive home. Gil, just stick with what works. And that's why we call them standard operating procedures. Anyway, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, my bad decisions, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think this show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Lescamella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Otaviani, George Fow, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, David Small, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at SoundCloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. 
I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.